Good. Welcome to the Harriet Beecher Stowe House presentation of the Queens of the Queen City, Cincinnati Stories of African American Women. We are proud to partner with the National Afro-American Museum and Cultural Center in Wilberforce for today's events. This presentation is an adaptation of their current exhibit, Queens of the Heartland. I'm Christina Hartley, the Executive Director at the Harriet Beecher Stowe House. And for today's presentation, I will ask that you keep your cameras and mics off for the main presentation. That way we can focus our attention on Hadley and Nicole, our speakers. Once they complete the presentation portion, then we'll open up for questions. So at that point, you may either do a virtual hand raise and we'll call on you to come on camera and ask your question, or you can type your question into the chat. So about our speakers today, Hadley Droge is the Assistant Curator of the National Afro-American Museum and Cultural Center in Wilberforce. Her recent exhibits cover topics such as the Dayton, such as Dayton Funk mu Music, African-American Women in Ohio, the Randolph Freed People. And she was an invited contributor to the Ohio Humanities publication Pathways Magazine in 2020 and is co-teaching the Historical Interpretation and Exhibits class at Wright State University in 2021. She lives with her family in the Huffman's Historic District in Dayton. Nicole Washington is a mixed media artist working and living in New York. In 2016, she graduated from the School of Visual Arts where she earned a master's degree in digital photography. Nicole's work is featured in the inaugural issue of MFON, Women Photographers of the African Diaspora. She has created art for companies such as Insecure, HBO, Black Girls Code, and Refinery29. Nicole has led hands-on workshops at Casita Maria, Vibe Theater, and Lower East Side Girls Club. So <clears throat> I want to welcome both of them. And I'm going to have uh, Hadley and Nicole take it away from here. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting us, Christina, and thank you to everyone uh, for being with us today. I'm going to share my screen now. Let's see here. Let's see if, can everyone see that okay? All right. Oh yeah, I guess your microphones are off, so you can't really yes, we can. <laughs> tell me one way or another, can you? So, oh. As Christina mentioned, we are here to talk about uh, some Cincinnati stories from our exhibit, um, Queens of the Heartland, on display now at the National Afro-American Museum and Cultural Center in Wilberforce, Ohio. I do want to mention that um, due to COVID, we are still closed. However, we should be reopening very soon. We will make that announcement uh, via social media and through our newsletter. So we hope that at that time, we can invite everyone uh, to come visit the exhibit. We also wanted to introduce uh, some of the lessons that these women taught us uh, because history, as you know, is so much more than what happened. It's a toolkit that we can use to help shape our future. So again, thank you for being with us here today. I first want to just briefly introduce the exhibit. Uh, here you see an image of the entrance and exit and some of Nicole's really incredible um, illustrations there on those three pedestals uh, featuring different kinds of crowns uh, to our Queen's exhibit. This project profiles 30 African American women um, who all had ties to Ohio. Some were born here, uh, some came here for educational opportunities, and features around 100 original artifacts. Most of them come from our collection at the museum. However, we do have a few items on loan, uh, some really special things from Wilberforce University archives. This began as a response to the whitewashing of suffragist history. But as we kind of dove into the subject, we realized we couldn't start the story um, with the 19th Amendment. And we certainly couldn't end it since uh, voter suppression, um, you know, made it so that the 19th Amendment really did not allow uh, African-American women in many instances to vote. And of course, we're still um, fighting for that right uh, today as a nation to end voter suppression. We also really wanted to connect to a younger audience. 
And so we use social media to inform our design. You can see the uh, bio panels of the women are designed um, similar to Instagram selfies with their the kind of comment as their bio. And uh, we also used a set of icons um, to represent the different movements that many of these women participated in throughout history. So if you're not a big reader, you can still understand uh, the history and the importance of each woman and the movements that they were a part of just by following along with these icons. Um, but I'll say one of the most important things that we did was to partner with Nicole um, and to help bring these women to life. I think Oftentimes when you look at a, a black and white photo, there's a disconnect where you don't really see how present um, their legacies are um, in, in today, uh, with us today. So, you know, I can tell you what happened as an historian, but Nicole really used her art um, and her voice to bring these women to life. And so I'd like uh, to, have her talk a little bit more about her process here um, and introduce some of these women. Thank you, Hadley. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. Um, so one of my main goals when creating these uh, digital illustrations or photo illustrations was to really almost make like superheroine characters out of these women. Um, I wanted viewers to, one, see that the contributions of these women are, are really great. Just like, you know, when you think about like a Superman or a Spider-Man, I feel like you uh, don't often see people of color in those roles. And there's so many great contributions that Black people and especially Black women have made. And so I wanted to really elevate these women and put them on a pedestal. But I also really wanted to have viewers see themselves in these images. And so, um, you know, someone like this illustration of Nikki Giovanni, Nikki Giovanni is someone that's pretty well known, but some of the other women are not so well known. And so I wanted to use these bright splashes of color and these very geometric shapes to really uh, call attention to viewers, to bring them closer, to say that looks like something very modern and that looks like something that I relate to. And so then they would get closer and they would be able to really dive into Hadley's wonderful research. And when they dive into that research, they are able to, um, I guess, ingest it in a way where they see themselves in the story and not just looking at something that's being taught to them or um, forced upon them. I really wanted uh, viewers to uh, feel like they are, um, like they can identify with these stories. And the other thing that I thought a lot about when creating these images, especially when I was highlighting um, women that are no longer with us, no longer alive, is that I really like this idea of Afrofuturism. And I know that term has been around for a while. And the way that I see it is bringing these historical stories into the present, but also imagining what they can be in the future. And so, you know, personally, um, when I was creating these images, it was so powerful because so many of these women have inspired my work and also their, their uh, efforts allow me to be the artist that I am today and really um, I'm able to use my voice because of the work that these women have done. And so um, there was this real um, connection as I was highlighting these women and reading their stories. And there was this real relationship of me realizing like, wow, all of this work that has been done um, has allowed me to do what I do today. And I wanted uh, viewers to be able to experience that. But I also, especially when, it, when it's younger viewers, I want then hopefully my illustrations to inspire young people to keep, um, keep telling these stories and be inspired by the work that these women do so that their work can continue because there's 
so much that we can all do by using our unique gifts and voices. And so um, I, I, my hope is that the art inspires that as well as, you know, have these research. Thank you so much. I think um, your contribution elevates this exhibit from, um, I don't want to say just a history exhibit because I love history, but it has this dual um, identity as being an art exhibit as well. So uh, even if you're not necessarily interested in all the history, just looking at Nicole's images, you can still get a sense of the character of each person. And I love how you represented um, their spirit or their character uh, in such a such unique ways. So um, each one is so different, but really speaks to um, and complements uh, the research. So it's been a really fun journey. <laughs> yes, it has. Um, I do want to give a quick disclaimer about language. A lot of the um, institutions or organizations um, or events that I might talk about uh, use more antiquated terms um, like colored, for example. And I just wanted to uh, kind of warn the audience um, up front that as I use these historic terms, um, you know, the, to, to be aware that they are, uh, you know, within this story. I also kind of want to talk about why Ohio. Uh, first of all, it is part of our mission to tell Ohio stories. We are a division of the Ohio History Connection. But I also think Ohio is such an interesting cross section of the um, dueling philosophies uh, that existed in the nation, kind of at the beginning and um, of our timeline and in present day. In Ohio, especially, we tend to want to tell the stories of when we were the good guys. And I think we need to do a better job of um, telling both sides of the story because that wasn't uh, the only reality in the state, just like that certainly wasn't the only reality in the country. So, you know, we were the first free state from the Northwest Territory, but right off the bat, as we were developing our constitutions in 1803, uh, the assembly voted to disenfranchise African-American men uh, by two votes. Then a year later, we established the Black Codes that ripped uh, civil rights from um, African Americans living in the state. And then there's also outright violence, uh, like series of race attacks that occurred in Cincinnati. I believe the um, 1841 race attack uh, saw about 1,500 um, white terrorists attack uh, the Black community of Cincinnati, uh, who fought back valiantly, thankfully. Um, and then you also have instances like the Randolph Freed people in 1846, in one of the largest emancipations in the United States, um, who were robbed of their inheritance when they uh, migrated to the state to relocate. Uh, we like to talk about the Underground Railroad and how there's a strong uh, Black church presence in the state, and that's certainly true, but in 1850, we enacted the Fugitive Slave Law or Fugitive Slave Act, which uh, Francis Harper, who we'll meet in a minute, um, said turned the state into a hunting ground for African Americans, and there were so many victims of this law. There were also, as I mentioned earlier, educational opportunities at places like Oberlin and Wilberforce. Um, Oberlin was one of the first colleges to admit African Americans and the first in the country to admit women. And Wilberforce was the first black owned and operated uh, HBCU in the country. And so you have these really wonderful safe places in the state. However, uh, they were sometimes infiltrated too. Oberlin is often called a, uh, an abolitionist stronghold, but um, Edmonia Lewis, we'll talk about a little bit later, had a very terrifying experience there. And in 1865, uh, the main campus of Wilberforce was set fire and burned um, and cost them lots of money. It took a long time to recover from that. So I think we need to be honest about, um, you know, how this nation came to be known kind of, uh, or how our state, excuse me, came to be known as kind of this swing state because there were so many conflicting philosophies, you know, caught in this kind of tug of war for civil rights. So that brings us to one of the first lessons, which is that 
the women in this exhibit um, are so much more than their list of firsts. I think um, we have a tendency to teach African American history in this country um, by scattering kind of a disconnected map of first achievers across the landscape. And um, what that does is really rob us of a true understanding of how our nation came to be. Not only did African Americans physically build so much of this country, but we're also so important in shaping um, the nation philosophically and intellectually. And it also, by just focusing on the first, it also kind of normalizes the white experience. So uh, we tend to look at what white people did as the norm and then um, show you know, women and African Americans and African American women as following in those footsteps. So it normalizes, you know, the white experience. Um, I'm not saying we shouldn't celebrate the first because they do represent, uh, you know, incredible triumphs over adversity, but they're just not the only story. And so to exemplify this lesson, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Frances Harper, who I mentioned a bit ago. She was born in Baltimore in 1825 and experienced uh, deep loss right off the bat. She was orphaned at age three. Her Aunt Henrietta and Uncle William Watkins uh, took her in and raised her and educated her. Uh, they ran a, a very reputable school for Black youth. And so she had this um, strong upbringing where she not only learned basic subjects like math and reading, but also she was educated in black liberation. In 1850, she moved to Ohio to become the first um, woman teacher at Union Seminary. And Union Seminary was uh, the first kind of educational endeavor uh, by the AME church. And um, so she begins teaching there, but soon kind of has the rug pulled out from under her because the um, AMA Church and uh, B uh, Bishop Payne has the opportunity to purchase the land at Wilberforce and establish Wilberforce University. So they funnel the funds um, from Union Seminary, shut that school down and kind of move them over to Wilberforce. So uh, she, Start, actually is a, a, an accomplished poet early on in her life. She um, published Forest Leaves when she was very young. And uh, so she continues to write and to publish in um, Black newspapers. She moves to Pennsylvania and moves into a, um, the home of a friend, William Still and his wife. And William Still is uh, today considered the father of the Underground Railroad. So again, she's entrenched in this idea of Black liberation and takes uh, a strong role um, in the Underground Railroad alongside of him. And um, as historians and really the public, we have to thank William Still for his work because he published a lot of uh, her letters that he had written to him. And so this is one of the... Um, few clues we have into her mind, uh, you know, are these letters that he preserved um, for posterity. So uh, I really appreciate everything that he did. And it's really fascinating to read her words, um, you know, from her own uh, writings. Um, we can understand her thoughts and feelings that way. Um, her poem, Eliza Harris, uh, was actually inspired by uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. And it, like a lot of her poetry, uses uh, fear and um, really kind of descriptive language to help people who were, especially white people, people who had no connection whatsoever with slavery, um, to understand what that really was, that to, to kind of tear down these myths of benevolence and uh, paternalism. And I think she's very successful in that. And uh, so she also published a serialized novel called Mini Sacrifice and a novel um, titled Iola Leroy in her life. And she was one of the most popular black poets of her day. She had works of poetry that were reprinted, sold out and reprinted four times and really laid the foundation for Paul Lawrence Dunbar to follow in her footsteps. So by now you might be wondering what her connection to Cincinnati is uh, because I've kind of given her entire biography and not mentioned the city once. Uh, but in 1860, she married a Cincinnati widower named Fenton Harper. 
And what's so interesting is that we have all of these letters, uh, we you know have all of her printed works, but we really know very little about him and we know almost nothing about their marriage or their romance. She really didn't talk about that very much. And we don't even fully know how they met. It's possible that they met two years prior in 1858 at the Convention of Colored Men of Ohio. It took place in Cincinnati. Uh, it was a place, um, an event where a group of really prominent citizens discussed um, civil rights and, and how to, you know, fight, work in that fight. And uh, Frances actually took a very active and leading role. She was the only woman delegate and supposedly made the largest financial contribution um, of anyone there of $10. And... Um, so some historians have also speculated that she met Fenton while uh, she was teaching at Union Seminary. We just simply don't know yet. Uh, but I encourage anyone listening to um, try to discover this, become a detective, and try to uh, find out, you know, what, what her story really is. Um, what is known is that she and Fenton moved to a farm outside of Columbus. She used her savings to purchase uh, that home. And... Um, they raised Harper's uh, children from his previous marriage, as well as uh, gave birth to a daughter named Mary, who was her beloved daughter and followed her everywhere for the rest of their lives. Uh, they lived here with a family um, until Fenton died just four years after marriage, and um, which is really tragic. But the other interesting thing about this union is that uh, Frances neither published nor lectured during this time. And again, we don't know, was she extremely happy with home life? Was she just very busy? Um, you know, she just left us so few clues. So, uh, you know, there's definitely something here to discover. After Fenton died, she immediately uh, takes up, you know, the mantle again, becomes a successful paid lecturer for a variety of anti-slavery societies. She travels all over the country, including doing a Southern tour. Um, and she was eventually appointed superintendent of the Pennsylvania Women's Christian Temperance Union. Because Frances, like a lot of her peers and contemporaries, uh, saw alcoholism and slavery as two sides of the same coin. And so she really worked um, to eradicate alcoholism as well as fighting for uh, uh, suffrage. Um, she uh, helped found the National Association of Colored Women, uh, which I'll refer to as the NACW from here on out, that um, did made excellent strides towards the passage of the 19th Amendment as well as fighting for um, uh, like the anti-lynching movement and other in education. Um, Frances was at one time believed to be the first African-American woman to publish a book in the U.S., but um, further scholarship shows that that's probably not true, but this doesn't really diminish her impact or her legacy whatsoever, and it doesn't even diminish the importance of the work. If we only look at her first, we lose the, um, this rich history and the importance of her legacy and her life. So, you know, while she did have her first, it's important to, to just include that as a part of this greater story. Lesson two is that these heroes were not islands, that they collaborated and formed collectives, and that is how uh, they enacted change. I think we have um, this history of favoring the myth of the great white man, which thankfully, you know, over the last several decades we've been pulling away from. Um, but these women really show us the power of the collective. Their collaboration, friendships, and mentorships um, are what really fueled social progress in this country. And together they helped shape America um, into a place that looked more like the original promise where all people were free and uh, had the right to pursue joy. And of course we are still working towards that today. Um, some of the women in the exhibit were easier to connect, like Ida Gibbs Hunt, um, Anna Julie Cooper, and Mary Terrell were all classmates and friends at Oberlin. Uh, they were actually lifelong friends, and um, Mary's only daughter was a, a bridesmaid in Ida's wedding. There's even a photograph of them in their 70s or 80s uh, where they're all, um, you know, they, they've gotten back together and it looks like they're just picking up right where they left off. But some of the women um, were more difficult to trace. 
Lucretia Howe Newman Coleman was actually born in Ontario, so technically she's Canadian, uh, but she spent a good deal of her childhood in Cincinnati um, and also on the move. Her father was um, a pastor in a uh, Baptist church, and so he relocated the family from um, Cincinnati to Haiti to Jamaica. Uh, and when slavery was abolished back to Cincinnati, kind of in search of freedom and a right to um, build a life. While in Cincinnati, her uh, father became the pastor of the Union Baptist Church and also worked closely with the Black press. So it's likely that this um, instilled in Lucretia a uh, sense of the power of the written word and also um, the power of a strong Black community. After the death of her father, though, um, her stepmother moved the family to Appleton, Wisconsin, and she enrolled in school in Lawrence University in, in Wisconsin, where she majored in science. Um, it's unclear if she graduated with a degree. Some sources say she did, some sources say she did not, but she did uh, leave Wisconsin, move to Kentucky, and um, help to establish uh, schools for Black youth. So she did receive an education, whether she got the degree or not, and she wanted to pass that on to other people. While in Kentucky, she met Benjamin Arnett, who you see uh, pictured there next to her, uh, surrounded by his loving family. And Bishop Arnett was um, a bishop in the AME church, was an incredibly powerful figure uh, in his day. He helped establish Wilberforce University, founded Payne Seminary. Um, he was also a politician, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. And she was so impressive that he hired her as his secretary and bookkeeper, and he became her mentor and supporter. And while working alongside him, she published several scientific works, um, including one article that used science to debunk eugenics, which I think is uh, really cool. And Lucretia just continued to write and publish, and she actually became incredibly popular even though um, most of us have never heard her name. In 1890, she published a biography of Benjamin Arnett um, called The Story of Real Life, Poor Ben, A Story of Real Life. And both of these images are actually taken from the book. The image of her is uh, the image she submitted as a photograph of the author. Three years after that, she was included in a book by a man named um, Monroe A. Majors, who was a figure um, worthy of attention in his own right. If you're not familiar with him, definitely uh, Google him. But uh, he wrote this book that profiled African American women, and I love this, but he called her writing spicy. <laughs> and he basically said that, um, you know, she's unafraid. She writes what, what she wants, what she knows is true. And uh, so she, he really paints this um, kind of exciting portrait of her as an author. Other people like uh, Reverend William J. Simmons of the American Baptist Church thought that she had the potential to um, rival, if not surpass, the popularity of Harriet Beecher Stowe. So it's kind of shocking to hear these reviews of her um, contemporary reviews. And then to look at today, we have almost no knowledge of her uh, in the public consciousness. So, you know, she was one of the most celebrated authors of her day, but is now almost completely disappeared. So we have to dig a little deeper to see the connection she may have made. And she was so well connected um, that we know they have to be there. We just hope that we can find them. So one woman that I think she may have met um, was Hallie Quinn Brown. Hallie was born in either 1845 or 49, depending on the source, source to um, a supportive family of black activists. And she became an elocutionist, uh, which if you're not familiar, it's a, someone who um, studies the art of public speaking. So it's not just an orator, a public speaker, but actually um, turning it into a science and an art. And um, she was also a teacher. She taught in the South at Tuskegee Institute, Dayton Public Schools, and eventually her alma mater, Wilberforce University. And um, like Frances Harper, she was always in demand for her uh, oratory skills. She performed um, for all kinds of audiences, including British royalty. And she was also a prominent club woman and one time president of the NACW. Um, so Lucretia and Hallie share a lot in common, but it actually may have been the men in their lives that brought them together. So if you look at the picture of the three men there, 
Um, over to the left is Benjamin Arnett, and the middle is Jer Brown, who's Hallie's brother. And the third man is, um, is Robert James Harlan, who was a prominent civil rights activist and politician from Cincinnati. Between 1886 and 1887, um, Lucretia's friend, Benjamin Arnett, and Halley's brother, Jer Brown, and Harlan there, um, again, this theme of collaboration, uh, they successfully worked to repeal those Ohio Black laws that I had talked about earlier. Um, so, you know, we have this connection with these men who worked very closely, and they're very close to these women in their lives. So it's hard to believe that Hallie and Lucretia didn't know of each other and may have even um, crossed paths. And I'll mention uh, in a second one place I think they might have crossed paths, um, e even if they didn't actually speak to each other. Another woman that I think, well, actually, uh, we know that um, did cross paths with Lucretia is Edmonia Lewis. And I mentioned her earlier, she studied at Oberlin College. Uh, she was born in either Ohio, but probably in New York. She was um, one of America's great sculptors and master PR agent. Uh, she really had the press in the palm of her hands and shaped her identity uh, using her um, heritage as both an African-American woman and Ojibwe woman to kind of craft this um, exotic identity that was also used at times to completely reject and shame white culture. So she once said something like the only reason that she was a part of society at, at all was because of her love and talent for sculpting. And if not for that, she would still be running in the woods. And so um, she was really fiery uh, character and you can trace her path through newspaper accounts all over the country. And it's really exciting to see her appear at kind of these, um, you know, events of, of, you know, black liberation, black philosophy, even though she pretended like she, um, you know, kind of rejected all of society. She was very active in, in her community. She relocated to um, Rome, Italy, but again, she would come back to the United States when she would exhibit her work uh, or to visit friends. And um, one of Edmodian's friends and patrons was Peter H. Clark, who was really formidable black activist from Cincinnati. You can see his picture there down kind of at the bottom. And uh, he was credited with establishing the first black public school in the state. Um, he was heavily involved in the abolitionist movement, the Underground Railroad, and in politics, um, running for state senate as a member of the Socialist Party in 1878. Uh, Clark had purchased three of Edmonia's works, and in 1879, Edmonia came to Cincinnati to exhibit her work called The Bride of Spring at the Catholic Ladies' Bazaar. And this event actually was um, extremely important. The New York Times reported on it, and um, while she was here uh, in Cincinnati, she also attended another event of the season, which was the um, wedding of Martha, also known as Mattie Fawcett. Um, Mattie was the daughter of Peter Farley Fawcett and um, Sarah Myron Fawcett, who you see there uh, kind of in the middle. And then that newspaper article shows you, um, or the newspaper article is talking about uh, the wedding there. And um, both Peter Fawcett and Sarah Fawcett were uh, like Peter Clark, abolitionists, underground railroad conductors, um, civil rights activists, and they both also owned successful businesses. Uh, Peter was a caterer and Sarah uh, was kind of this elite hair, hairdresser to the, um, to the wealthy of the city. And um, so in the Cincinnati Inquirer article that you see there, it not only reported on this wedding as being, um, you know, this, this incredible event, it actually listed uh, a number of the guests. It described the bridal party's clothing in detail. It even listed what some of the presents were. And so it described Edmonia Lewis, um, you know, in attendance, and also pointed out that Lucretia was uh, one of the bridesmaids. Now it's um, 
Not clear if Maddie and Lucretia were friends or if they were brought together through their families. It's also not clear if Edmonia and Lucretia ever spoke to each other at this event. We can't be sure. Um, there were a lot of people there. But what we do know is that uh, they were in attendance at this you know, same event. And it's hard to believe that Lucretia wouldn't have known of Edmonia because Edmonia was such a celebrated artist at the time. And as we know, Lucretia um, you know, was in her own right as well. Uh, you know, I also think that it's possible that Hallie Quinn Brown was at this wedding. It's reported down at the bottom that there was a Mr. John Brown and his sister Hattie Brown from Dayton. Um, I'm wondering if that is a misprint of Hallie's name. Uh, right now it's just speculation. I'm still digging to see, but they were in Dayton. She did have a brother, John, and it's certainly plausible that she would have been at this wedding. Um, so, Hopefully I can update everybody on a blog post later or something. Uh, but, you know, mapping this event, I think, just helps understand uh, their worlds and how their circles intersected. And it also shows um, the richness and the fortitude of Cincinnati's Black community at this time. Sarah and Peter Fawcett were so influential um, that some of the most famous figures of the day came far and wide uh, to their daughter's wedding. Uh, this white mainstream newspaper reported it uh, in great detail. And, um, you know, all the biggest names that were in attendance, you know, had all fought for civil rights and claimed space in Cincinnati's public consciousness, including, um, you know, Sarah Fawcett here. In 1860, she had successfully desegregated Cincinnati streetcars. And this uh, kind of brings us to another lesson that we learned um, that all of these women were architects of change, that uh, they laid one layer of brick after another um, towards shaping, you know, the nation. Many of you who are from Cincinnati probably already know um, this queen, Marianne Spencer. Uh, she was also not born in Cincinnati, but born in Gallipolis, Ohio in 1920. She grew up with her family in her grandfather's home, um, which was also a general store. And um, this is a really important thing to note. I think that like the other women we've met today, she had a really strong supportive upbringing that instilled the sense of pride and courage in her very early on. Um, when she was about eight years old, the KKK marched through the town right next to their home and general store and she was terrified um, but their father made her and her siblings come out to the balcony and look at them instead of hiding inside and uh, he pointed out one person in particular and said um, do you see that person that's you know the person that sold them penny candy um, after school and he said to the, the kids that uh, they're all wearing masks because of their shame, because they know what they're doing is wrong. And so from that, that just kind of flipped everything on its head. And from then on, um, Marion saw uh, her role in this fight for civil rights. And she joined the NAACP um, by the age of 13. She has an incredibly long history, um, you know, of, of desegregation and of claiming space. And uh, she and her twin sisters are credited, uh, twin sister are credited as the first African Americans inducted into the National Honor Society. They were awarded a scholarship to attend the University of Cincinnati. Um, and that's where she met her husband, who joined her in this fight uh, to desegregate various campus functions. She's probably best known um, for her desegregation work uh, in the 1950s. She led a successful campaign uh, to open up Cincinnati's Coney Island Park um, to children of all races uh, with the hope of the NAACP. And she really wanted to do that, she said, to prove um, to her sons that they were valuable uh, because she, she didn't want them to see that they were excluded from any place when they should not have been. Um, she eventually became president of the Cincinnati chapter of the NAACP and was elected to city council, was a chairperson of the Ohio Civil Rights Commission, among other uh, titles. And I just want to dedicate this presentation today to her, uh, since she was once called the Queen of Queen City. Um, Another lesson we learned was that our nation was shaped by thousands of names that we will never speak. And that's a really sobering thought, um, but it's really true. And um, that kind of came to light as we were digging through 
um, the lists of names that we wanted to include and we had to exclude some of them. Um, you know, there are women from Cincinnati that should be included in the exhibit, but uh, unfortunately just the resources forced us to edit and, and pick the 30 that um, we thought we could tell their stories best. And uh, Nikki Giovanni is another person who really likes to champion um, the unsung heroes of, uh, of this country. She's a prolific author and a poet and an accomplished educator. Um, but in an interview, she once pointed out that without all the grandmas marching behind them, there would be no Dr. King. And I think this is so true that we always uh, give credit to our leaders and you know, rightfully so in many instances, but that it's again, this power of collaboration, the power of the collective that uh, helps support those leaders and carry us through uh, into these thres thresholds of change. Her attention to the grandmas is probably due in part um, because Nikki's grandma, Luvenia, was such a formative figure in her own life. Um, Luvenia was this fearless club woman, um, you know, like other women that we've talked about so far, and she would take young Nikki to protests and meetings with her. Um, for the most part, Nikki did grow up in Cincinnati and later wrote one of her most acclaimed poems, Nikki Rosa, about her experience. Um, but when she reached high school age, she went to live with her grandparents in Knoxville, where she had been born. Nikki went further south for college, attending Fisk University, and reestablished the, the SNCC chapter there. She became more passionate about her activism, more entrenched um, in the Black Arts Movement, and even founded Cincinnati's first Black Arts Festival in 1969. In 1968, uh, she published her first work of poetry called Black Feeling, Black Talk. Over the course of her life, um, Nikki has published more than 30 works. I think it's closer to 40, if not surpassed 40. And she's made um, sound recordings that were Grammy nominated, received accolades from the NAACP, Oprah Winfrey. She's honestly won more awards than we have time to um, list here today. Uh, she's also been a professor at multiple universities, and um, in 1999, she was named the University Distinguished Professor at Virginia Tech, which is the university's um, highest title that it awards. She wrote and read a poem at the convocation at, after the school shooting in 2007 that brought everyone to their feet in a unified chant. So in this moment of great tragedy, she unifies, brings together, and reminds everyone um, about life. And uh, she's always been outspoken about the exclusion of women leaders from revolutionary movements and also a su uh, supportive voice and a strong advocate um, for LGBTQ plus issues. She's also today a grandmother. And the last lesson um, that we will leave you with is that this history is alive and all around us. And I do wanna leave time for questions. Um, so I'll just briefly talk about this wonderful person that you see before us, Yona Harvey. Like so many women that we've talked about, she is a, an award-winning poet. Um, but she also took an interesting path in her writing and became a comic writer. She became the first African-American woman to write for Storm, the character from Marvel Comics. And that's really uh, astonishing considering that Storm appeared in the 70s and it wasn't until you know Harvey um, helmed the uh, or took the you know pen to paper that that Storm actually had the voice of someone who could um, give authenticity, lend authenticity to these experiences. She might even be a superhero. I'm not sure, but um, she was born in Cincinnati uh, and left her hometown to attend Howard University, where she had intended to study nursing, but she just became so enraptured by um, this creative community there and uh, came into contact with uh, the um, author and uh, journalist Tanasi Coates. And he kind of you know, floated in and out of her life um, until he became the writer for Black Panther, called her up and uh, said, how would you like to um, write for Marvel Comics? And so from there on, um, she's been involved with Mar Marvel Comics. She uses her writing to, uh, she says, make women's li Black women's lives visible and um, to present complex human characters. And I think that's really important. But we see her, um, you know, her work as 
an outspoken activist, as uh, this award-winning poet, as um, another page in this long legacy and this long fight for freedom, this long fight to uh, build the America that we were promised. And um, so I would like at this point um, to open it up and to um, see if anyone has any questions about anything that we've talked about today. Well, Hadley, we did have a couple of questions in the chat as you were going. And the okay. first one I wrote down is, where was the Union Seminary when you were talking about Francis Ellen Watkins Harper? Oh, sure. That's a great question. It was right outside of Columbus. Um, I'm not exactly sure uh, the specific location. It's, uh, and I'm not sure that anyone really knows. That it's very difficult to um, find out any specific information about the school, but we do know that it was outside of Columbus. So that's maybe the reason why she chose that area um, to build a life with her family. Mm, good. All right. Um, there was another question about where we can read the writings of these women, and then someone else put in the chat a link to how to get Harper's work. I don't know that there was a, a good idea of where to read some of the other ones, like, um, oh, I lost my note, but uh, is there <laughs> the, the, um, the second one, Newman? Lucretia, yeah, I know, yeah, she's Lucretia. got so many names. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's a great question, because one of the things that was really astonishing to me is that we have um, excluded these women from, like, mainstream education or from the public consciousness, but so many of them wrote, published, uh, wrote autobiographies. Like there's no reason, you know, that we wouldn't, we've, we've purposefully hidden this history. And so it's time to unearth it. I would um, look to Happy Trust, which is a kind of a um, digitized source of, of, uh, archival works. I think that they have poor Ben, um, archived there. The sad part about Lucretia is that many of her works um, historians have not found. So we know she may have published uh, articles, but we don't actually have the articles because the uh, publication that it was produced in um, is nowhere to be found at this time. So again, this project we hope is just really the beginning, um, or at least a stepping stone in, you know, uh, this larger project of, of bringing these stories to light. So anything, any mystery or anything I don't know, or if you find out, you know, something I, is incorrect, it's awesome to connect and to share that, that history. Um, and there are just so many opportunities to be a detective here, I think. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, so another couple of questions that have come through the chat, um, let's see, where can we purchase your work, Nicole? Oh, um, well, I, the, the particular illustrations aren't for sale, but, um, I do have a website, um, NicoleWashington.com, that's N-I-C-H-O-L-E, uh, Washington.com, and that has, uh, my portfolio and prints and things like that. Excellent. Thank you. And then how long will the show run at the museum since it was originally scheduled to be done this month? <laughs> so what's the extension period, so to speak? Oh, that's, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, it's actually going to run at least through 2022. So there should be plenty of time post COVID, hopefully, that our doors will be open and, you know, we can all celebrate together. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, so I've got, uh, there's, yes, Hathi Trust is H-A-T-H-I Trust, right? Yes, yes. I was going to type that into the chat and someone already did. So yes, oh, that is correct. Yeah, and then um, there are a couple other uh, sites like that that are kind of digital libraries. Um, you can always go on worldcat.org and search any particular work and it'll tell you all of the libraries that um, own that particular work. You can request it then from your own library 
or a lot of times it'll show where um, digitized copies are. Okay, excellent. Um, can you tell us about some of the artifacts that we can see in the exhibit? Oh yeah, great question. Um, so outside of the kind of three crowns that you see, um, one of my favorite artifacts is a love letter from um, Fanny uh, Jackson Coppin's husband, Levi Coppin, who was an AME bishop. And uh, Fanny was one of the first um, African-American women to helm a major institution of higher learning. And she was a force for education. She would um, lecture uh, all about, you know, the importance of educating and um, how you shouldn't go educate where it's easy, go to the South, and that's where people need it most. And so she and her husband um, were both really dedicated to their own work, but they were very much in love. So they would both kind of go on to their own um, projects. And he was in uh, Cape Town for a while and wrote her this love letter. And it's so cool. It, he talks about like, I mean, if you made a checklist of all the really important things happening in 1901, it's like he wrote, uh, talks about all of them. And, uh, and it's very tender and sweet. There's also um, biographies, yeah, autobiographies that uh, women wrote. Lucretia's um, Poor Ben uh, that I mentioned. Benjamin Arnett's copy of Poor Ben is in the exhibit. Um, there are original photographs, Ruby D. Um, Ruby D's shoes that are adorable mules, you know, encrusted in jewels. Uh, so all different kinds of things. We have a um, 19th century handmade wedding dress and uh, some other garments and um, important scrapbooks featuring uh, clippings from black newspapers. So lots of different types of artifacts. There is a, uh, if you go to our website, uh, for the National Afro-American Museum, there is a link to a uh, virtual tour that Nicole and I give. And so you can see some of the artifacts um, and hear more about Nicole's amazing artwork um, in the video. Great, great. Uh, someone asked, because she missed the very beginning, the exhibit's not open now and you anticipate it reopening, well, you anticipate the museum reopening probably in April? That's what we're hoping. We, I can't say, do not quote me as April, but I'm not the one who makes that decision, but that's what we're hoping. We, we certainly want to um, do things as safely as possible uh, for the public. And, um, you know, we like what the Stowe House is doing with uh, private tours. So we're entertaining a lot of different options and um, kind of as a staff talking about what we can offer to the public. But yeah, we're hoping very soon that we will reopen. Good. All right, so this is a longer question, but <clears throat> uh, actually one of our board members says, the issue of uh, her maybe becoming as famous as Harriet Beecher Stowe is interesting. It's hard to imagine anymore, but of course Stowe herself almost fell out of the canon for a while with works going out of print. And it wasn't until academic feminism that she was revived, or so to speak. Is there anything that you can mention about the intersectional struggles of any of the women you talked about maybe Harper and Lucretia Howe, how to deal with as their light was hidden from the public eye, and do we see hope for their legacies? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Uh, we think of intersectionality as kind of being a term that's more modern, but actually Frances Harper spoke very clearly about that issue um, in one of her speeches where uh, she, I think it's called, we're all bound, uh, bound up together. Or she talks about all being bound up together and is really imploring um, white feminists of the time to, uh, to not uh, cast African-American women aside. Um, we see with the passage of the 15th Amendment with, um, you know, that the, there's this irreparable rift that occurs because white suffragists are extremely frustrated and angry that they don't um, get the ability to vote and African American men do. And so they, many of them resort to extremely racist uh, rhetoric that's unforgivable. And so it puts black women, um, you know, at this intersection where they have to choose between race and gender. And um, many women took up um, like, the, you know, the cause for their race 
because they had uh, often, you know, more of the support from African American men like Martin Delaney or Frederick Douglass, where uh, white suffragists often would collaborate when it was convenient and then cast them aside or try to um, to diminish their uh, accomplishments when it was not. And I think I'm very much paraphrasing here, but uh, Frederick Douglass said something like um, how white women didn't understand that when they were trying to get the vote, that they just wanted equal footing with their husbands and brothers. But for Black Americans, it was about survival. And I think that's a really important distinction to make. So we do see, um, you know, like I said, this, this rift in, uh, you know, in the women's community where, um, where white women, we could have been so much more supportive and could have made so much more progress if we hadn't um, supported white supremacy. And uh, we, we chose to do that instead. So that's kind of a call to action as we go forward to um, dismantle white supremacy. And um, that will, you know, push us all forward, I think. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so the next question, I believe, is for me, but um, someone is asking about the restoration efforts at the Harriet Beecher Stowe House. So I will give you a brief update, and that is that we are currently undergoing exterior restoration. Uh, it's a, a process that is occurring right now. So the things that have happened in 2020, they, um, and this is in conjunction with the Ohio History Connection, but they did all of the, you know, kind of uh, shoring up of the, the foundation uh, all the way around the house. And then late in 2020, they began the physical restoration that you can see. So one of the early processes of that was to remove the 20th century porch and reveal the original facade of the house. And they've taken off a lot of the roof line area that looks, that was a Victorianization added to it. And they have stripped all of the paint. So now it is currently kind of a red brick for most of it. The Monfort section uh, or the 1908 addition to the house is still white, but it's been power washed, uh, so to speak. So the paint has been stripped from the original Beecher section of the house, which is a, a big L shape on the north and west, yes, north and west sides. And then the Monfort section is just been power washed. What will be occur, what's occurring right now is actually they have scaffolding up and kind of a big tent over the scaffolding because they have ground out the mortar and are working on repairing the masonry and fixing the parts, replacing bricks that need to be replaced, and then re-mortaring everything. So, and then of course the, the bay window, which was also a 20th century addition to the house, has been removed as well. So that section, you know, there will be one window there as opposed to the bay window on both floors. So that section is uh, currently being rebuilt, so to speak. So a lot of work is going on. That's kind of the current state. It will continue throughout the spring. They will, they will finish the masonry. And then the last step for the restoration specialists that are working on it currently is to repaint. And when they repaint, the Beecher section will be painted a pale yellow color because that's what the paint analysis showed was the 1840 color of the house. And then the Montfort or the new addition uh, that we often call the green book section of the house is actually will be repainted white so that you can distinguish the two different time periods from the exterior. And then after they're finished, another group will come in and do replacement replica windows from the 1840s. So all of that should hopefully, and I'm crossing my fingers, uh, hopefully be done by mid to late summer. So that's the current state of the restoration. And then at some point this year, we will be talking about what's the next phase and in interior restoration. So that's my update. And now there's a couple of other questions in here. So I'm gonna go mm -hmm. back to, um, can Hadley speak to Peter Clark and how he became a socialist in the 1800s? Mm. You know, I do not feel comfortable 
exploring that story because I really, uh, he is kind of next on my reading list. A colleague of mine is actually um, ordering, there is a biography about him, a published work, and uh, I'm going to steal it from him as soon as he's done. I do know that he didn't um, stay in the party very long. I think he felt that they were not radical enough or did not have um, sp specific African-American um, issues uh, at heart. And so he, oh yeah. Okay. I'm going to steal it from you, Christina. <laughs> so this is, yeah. Um, America's first black socialist. Who is it by? Um, it is by Nikki Taylor. Okay. So, great. Okay, right. So she, she has published other things about Margaret Garner and about um, mm -hmm. the black community in Cincinnati in the early 1800s. But I have a copy of this from the library because we will actually be reading this book as part of the semicolon club in August and our host for the semicolon club meeting for that particular for this particular discussion is actually a guest host from the over the Rhine museum so um, that's a collaboration that we're going to have later this year so get yourself the book and sign up to do the book discussion in August we can learn together Amber. Uh, yes yes Okay, so um, let's see. Next question. Mm. All right, again, another long one. Uh, black male literati sometimes damaged black women's legacies too, as for instance, the very specific efforts of Booker T. Washington to obliterate Pauline Hopkins' writings and the lack of acknowledgement of the NACW as a precursor to the NAACP. And I was wondering about how patriarchy on both sides of the color line sometimes made it hard for these women. Yeah, I think that it's important to make a distinction um, between uh, white male patriarchy and African American male patriarchy. You could make the argument that Booker T. Washington adopted more of um, the attitudes of white male patriarchy because you do have Africana womanists like Martin Delaney, who I mentioned, and even Frederick Douglass. But some historians who study um, Frances Harper make this argument that her works uh, are far more important than they've ever gotten credit for being, that um, even like Langston Hughes, when he talks about her um, her novels, that he's he writes them about them a bit patronizingly. Um, and this is, you know, also in the, uh, you know, Black freedom movement and Black arts movement, why Nikki Giovanni got so frustrated because she felt like um, Black women's work was being diminished. But I think that, um, you know, we don't want to try to create that rift in the Black community because we do see so many of these Black women um, standing beside African American men in this fight. So, Yes, it's there, but it's not necessarily, I don't think you can um, claim it to be the same thing as what's, what happens with white male patriarchy. It's just different. Okay. All right. Um, if possible, can it be described how Frances Allen Wat Watkins Harper wrote Iola Leroy? Because I mm -hmm. heard that she wrote it because she saw the younger generation knew nothing about slavery. That actually, I don't know. Um, she, you're coming at me with some really <laughs> hard <laughs> questions here, uh, but I would believe that um, she did write often. Well, I would say predominantly about uh, Black women's experiences. So many of her characters were um, very strong African American women who were uh, fighting. Um, you know, for their freedom. And like the poem I mentioned, Eliza Harris, you know, is of course about a mother uh, f running away from enslavement uh, for um, the freedom of her child and for the life of her child. And so you see those characters, you know, appear in her work uh, very frequently. So I believe that if that's the case. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then also if, if people are interested in more on Peter Clark, there was some attention, and I remember this because I watched it earlier this week as well, but there is some attention given to Peter Clark in the current PBS documentary series on the Black Church, which is um, Henry Louis Gates' newest documentary in PBS. And uh, yeah, it would have been in the, in the first two hours when they were talking about the 1800s. And it was a, a short bit about him, but um, in the context of 
the formation of independent denominations. Oh, that's cool. I think he was also actually a delegate at the 1858 um, Ohio Convention of African American Men that I mentioned, where Francis was a delegate. He's he's uh, mentioned frequently in their um, like the minutes, basically of that meeting. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and someone asked about a link to the semicolon club. I'm going to try to put that in there in just a second, unless Abigail is still on and can do that for me. But, um, I, you know, a lot of people are just saying thank you and, and that it's been a great pr presentation. Um, another comment, Nicole, I really like your piece on your website. Baby girl respect is just the minimum. And um, if you have some time, we have a couple minutes, uh, you want to tell us a little bit about this piece or direct us to information about it that might be elsewhere. Um, sure. Um, so uh, I guess I know because that's not having to do with the exhibit, but uh, that piece um, is from a series that I did called For My Girls. And it was about how 1990s women in hip hop uh, inspired me to be bold and confident. And also they were kind of like a gateway into feminism for me. And so that piece is, um, um, it's a lyric from a Lauryn Hill song, the title, but also as you can see in the back of the piece, it has historical black women, um, some living like Angela Davis, but some that aren't living anymore. And I just wanted to show um, how, how I just wanted to show a layered piece about how these uh, different generations of Black women continue to inspire each other, kind of like showing the historical Black women in the background. And then obviously it's my piece, so it's inspiring me and then showing the current woman in the front, which is a photograph I took um, of, of the woman. Great, thank yeah. you. I also want to say Nicole is an amazing photographer. We don't even utilize that skill in this exhibit because we used um, archival photographs, but she's like a wonderful photographer too and has had uh, photography shows as well. Thank you. All right, a couple last things here. In the chat, there is links to next week's semicolon club discussion. And that is on uh, the film, Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. So if you want to join in our discussion on that next Saturday at noon, there's a link to sign up for that. And then we also put into the chat a link to all of the semicolon club information for the whole year. So you can see kind of the schedule uh, of what books we're, we're going to be discussing. So February is a movie discussion. And then the other four iterations of the semicolon club this year are book discussions. Uh, and it looks like we are out of questions. Uh, like I said, we have had a great response and a lot of people, uh, you know, just saying this is a great way to spend their afternoon and thank you so much. So I'm going to just say thank you all for joining us today for the Queens of Queen City. We appreciate your interest and support for great programming at the Harriet Beecher Stowe House. And check out our website, stowhousecincy.org, for additional information on lectures and discussions. I just mentioned do the right thing discussion next week. And then our next, uh, uh, after that, our next discussion is Wednesday, March 3rd at 7 p.m. And that's the discussion series led by John Getz. And it is called After Uncle Tom's Cabin, Black Voices for Justice. The topic, Alice Dunbar Nelson and Charles Chestnut. So see links and registration for that on our website. And with that, I'm going to say we've had a great time this afternoon. I want to give a special thanks to Hadley and a special thanks to Nicole for joining us today. And I will stick on for just a couple more minutes, but um, we appreciate all of your support and encouragement. Thank you all. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody.